Allied airstrikes. Great Britain votes to join the U.S. striking ISIS in Iraq. Husband, father, pastor, prisoner. The story of Saeed Abedini heard directly from his wife. Path to sainthood. Opus Dei's Spanish bishop will now be called blessed. And frozen in time. Part of Ellis Island opens to the public for the first time in 60 years. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Friday, September 26th, 2014. Good evening from Washington. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Brian Patrick with your news now. The U.S.-led coalition against the terrorist group ISIS is growing today. Three more nations agree to launch airstrikes against the militants in Iraq. Wyatt Goolsby is joining us with the details. Brian, heads of government in Belgium, Denmark, and the U.K. are calling ISIS, or the Islamic State, quote, a threat to the world. It's why the British prime minister says facing down the terrorists has become a matter of urgency. This is going to be a mission that will take not just months, but years. But I believe we have to be prepared for that commitment. And British Prime Minister David Cameron making his case today for Britain to join the coalition of Western and Arab nations in launching airstrikes against ISIS. Whether any use of force should be granted was debated. The words don't mention boots on the ground, but there's a consensus here that there will be boots on the ground. The only question, the only question being whose boots are they? In the end, British lawmakers agreed to commit warplanes to the fight in Iraq, but didn't authorize striking forces in Syria. Denmark and Belgium also agreed to contribute fighter jets. The announcements come as the U.S. military says coalition warplanes destroyed four tanks belonging to the militants in eastern Syria today. On the front line, Kurdish Peshmerga troops, who continue to battle ISIS in northern Iraq today along the Turkey-Syria border. ISIS cannot be defeated with just airstrikes. Karwan Zabari, part of the Kurdistan regional government, says airstrikes have to be part of a larger strategy, with allied nations supporting local forces on the ground with weapons and other aid. We will have to have boots on the ground, and we're not asking for EU or the American boots on the ground. We have the boots. We just need to be uh, properly equipped, and we hope that the international community will step up in, in equipping our Peshmerga forces. Pentagon officials also said today a ground force is needed to destroy ISIS, but those troops will not be American. So Brian once again affirming Iraqi, Kurdish, and other regional partners will play the central role on the ground. All right, Wyatt Goolsby, thank you. Now some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. Chicago's two major airports halted flights for hours this morning, affecting air traffic around the nation. More than 800 flights in and out of O'Hare and Midway airports were canceled. There was a fire at an air traffic control facility west of the city. The control center was evacuated. Management of the region's airspace was transferred to other centers. A contract employee there is believed to have started the fire. He was found on the scene with self-inflicted knife wounds. Very few details are being released tonight as an investigation continues. Co-workers of a woman beheaded in an Oklahoma City food processing plant say the suspect recently tried to convert employees to Islam. The 30-year-old man was shot yesterday by a company official who is a reserve sheriff's deputy. He was attacking 43-year-old Tracy Johnson after beheading 54-year-old Colleen Huford with a knife. The suspect had just been fired from his job at that same plant. He is now hospitalized along with the surviving victim. Police say they're waiting for the suspect to regain consciousness before filing charges. The FBI has been called into the investigation because of the nature of the crime in light of the Islamic State threats to behead Americans. The United States and dozens of other nations are committing today to speed up and strengthen U.N. peacekeeping operations. The U.N. Secretary General says more than 130,000 members of that force are already deployed worldwide. But the U.N. says it needs more help tackling commitments in crisis areas. The U.N. doesn't have a standing army of its own. It relies on member states to supply troops. Dozens of democracy advocates in Hong Kong tried to force their way into that city's government headquarters today. Police held flags warning the group of mostly students that they would use force to counter them if necessary. Today's events are the culmination of a week-long boycott over Beijing's practice of closed nomination elections. The group has demanded that China's communist leaders let the people pick their own leadership in 2017. 
Refugees fleeing the bloody war in Syria get stuck on their way to Italy. A cruise ship headed to Cyprus rescued 345 migrants from a smaller boat in distress. When the ship docked in Cyprus, most of the migrant passengers refused to leave. They insisted they be taken to Italy. After hours of negotiations, police removed the migrants from that ship. Officials in Cyprus say the Syrians will receive counseling and housing for now. Ultimately, they will have to formally seek asylum with the European nation or they will be returned to Syria. Pharmaceutical companies hope to make thousands of doses of experimental Ebola vaccine in the coming months. That word today from the World Health Organization in Switzerland. The WHO is partnering with drug makers for this effort. Right now, there is no vaccine that's proven reliable for humans. The agency says it's also exploring options to give the vaccine to health workers who deal directly with Ebola patients. If everything goes well again, we might be able to start to use some of these vaccines in affected countries in, um, at the beginning, the very beginning of next year, in January. The WHO says it's also looking at blood transfusions and serum treatments for patients. The outbreak has already claimed an estimated 2,900 lives in West Africa. The yearly Val Values Voter Summit kicks off here in Washington today. Republican leaders, including potential presidential candidates, are gathering here to focus on religious liberty issues. They will avoid topics seen as divisive within the party. As midterm elections near, Senator Ted Cruz predicts a GOP-controlled Senate. In 39 days, I believe we're going to retake the United States Senate and we are going to retire Harry Reid as majority leader. The gathering lasts through the weekend. Miriam Ibrahim will be honored at a dinner tonight. She is the Sudanese woman who was finally freed after being sentenced to death for refusing to denounce her Christian faith. It's good to have Betsy Woodruff back with us, the political writer for the Washington Examiner. Do you expect any surprises out of this values voter summit. One speech to keep an eye on is going to be from Rick Santorum, former Pennsylvania senator who's addressing the gathering tomorrow. He'll be arguing that conservatives should reach out to blue collar voters and take a more populist tone. So it's going to be interesting to see how that goes over, what kind of reaction it gets, and if that seems to be a messaging change that Republicans are going to be looking to implement. Do you think Santorum is testing the waters? Who is testing the waters? Which speakers? Santorum certainly is. Every indication suggests he's trying to keep his national profile, keep his organizational structure in place so that if he wants to run, he'll be able to. And of course, Bobby Jindal, the Louisiana governor, Senator Ted Cruz, and Senator Rand Paul have also attended this conference this year, and they're absolutely looking to gin up excitement for potential presidential bids. Cruz Jindal and uh, Santorum are both Catholic, so that's interesting to our viewers. Less than 40 days now before the midterm elections. What do you think are the, the big hot button issues, especially that the GOP needs to focus on? The Republican Party is definitely going to be talking about foreign policy, which is tricky because handling ISIS hasn't really brought about clear ideological splits. But we're going to hear lots of criticism of the president's handling of the threat, perhaps criticism that he abdicated his responsibility. We can also expect to hear a lot about immigration, particularly in the hotly contested New Hampshire Senate race. Scott Brown, former senator from Massachusetts, has really criticized his opponent, incumbent Jean Shaheen, for not being tough enough on tightening up America's immigration policy. So do you think the Senate will tip to the GOP this time around? It's hard to say. It's uh, close. My guess would be it's kind of a coin toss at this point. Yeah. Republicans have to pick up six seats. There's three that are basically guaranteed to pick up. And then there's three that are going to be really challenging. It just depends. Uh, Alaska is going to be very competitive. Incumbent Senator Mark Begich made a slip up by running and then having to pull a controversial ad. In Louisiana, we've got two Republican candidates that could split the vote. And in North Carolina, the Republican nominee, Tom Tillis, hasn't been as competitive as Republicans were hoping. So. It's interesting. It's going to be a fun couple of weeks. It should be. Let's talk about Eric Holder. He uh, resigned this week. The president announced his resignation. Why now? He's been there for six years. There's two years left in this administration. Is this a political move? What I hear is that the reason that Holder decided to resign now instead of later is so that his new replacement can be sworn in and confirmed in the Senate before January. In January, the new class of senators will enter the Senate, and if Republicans take the Senate back, which maybe Holder's expecting, it'd be a lot more difficult for the president to get his preferred nominee confirmed. Any idea who that is? 
We've heard some names batted around, but nothing really concrete. Uh, Governor Deval Patrick from Massachusetts is a potential contender. Uh, Kamala Harris, who's the Attorney General of California, and Jay Johnson, who's the, secre uh, the Secretary of, S of Homeland Security, who heads that bureau, is also a possible replacement. As Attorney General Holder did get a lot of exposure, any chance that he's going to run for something? Doubtful. He yeah. had such a controversial bid in the Attorney General's office, and he's such an electric partisan figure that it's hard to imagine him being able to launch a bid for the kind of office that he'd want. So this is not another Rahm Emanuel? Not that I can tell, although things are crazy enough in American politics right now that who knows? Keeps it interesting. From the Washington Examiner, one of my favorite papers, Betsy Woodruff, thanks for joining us. Thanks. Coming up, Madrid hosts the beatification of Opus Dei Bishop Alvaro del Portillo this weekend. And the family of a Christian pastor imprisoned in Iran pleads for his freedom. On Friday, the 26th of September, thanks for joining us for EWTN News Nightly. I'm Brian Patrick. Well, it was an end to an era for Yankees fans at Yankee Stadium last night in New York. Derek Jeter's last home game. He went out in style, finishing the game with a walk-off single. That helped New York beat Baltimore 6-5 while a packed stadium watched. The famed Yankee is ending a 20-season baseball career this year with almost 1,400 games in Yankee Stadium. Jeter plays just three more games as a designated hitter or DH in Boston this weekend. This weekend, it's official. Actor George Clooney is no longer America's most eligible bachelor. It's an international affair. He's marrying Beirut-born British national Amul Amaladeen in Venice. Water taxis in the city are sporting AG on their boats. That's for Amal and George. Celebrity guests include Cindy Crawford and Matt Damon. They'll attend the Saturday ceremony. Italian newspapers are calling it the wedding of the year. It's Clooney's second and Alamedin's first. Bishop Alvaro del Portillo will be beatified tomorrow in Madrid, Spain. The church's designation, Blessed, is just one step away from sainthood. Del Portillo was the Vatican-appointed bishop from 1975 to 1994 for members of Opus Dei, a worldwide Catholic movement. He worked alongside Opus Dei founder Saint Jose Maria Escriva, who nicknamed del Portillo Saxum, or Rock. He's also known for helping the poor, sick, and uneducated around the world. His successor at Opus Dei says Del Portillo's beatification is a sign to the world of everyday holiness. The Universal Church is very important, the beatification, because it's to, to show the one person, the normal person, offering everything, every details to our Lord. In Rome, celebrations are also underway. The public will be able to view Del Portillo's body for four days at the Opus Dei-run Basilica of St. Eugene. The weekend will be a proud celebration for Opus Dei members visiting and living in Rome. I've been giving thanks ever since it was announced, this beatification, as he taught us how to be thankful, how to be always thanking God for all the graces and the benefits, even the things that we don't know of. Opus, Dei's proje Opus Dei projects 150,000 people will be in Madrid this weekend for that beatification ceremony. An American pastor is still jailed for his Christian faith two years after he was first imprisoned in Iran. Our Jason Calvi is joining us now with the story. Yeah, Brian, and he's supposed to serve eight years. Iran says Pastor Saeed Abedini was a threat to national security. The charges and conviction relate to his leadership of Christian communities. He was first jailed while setting up an orphanage in his native country, but now it's his kids who have no dad at home. They pray that they'll come back home, but he's still not back home. Instead, from jail, Pastor Saeed Abedini writes his eight-year-old daughter, Rebecca Grace. His wife, Nagme, reads a note from her husband, written to their daughter. So let daddy hear you sing a loud hallelujah that, that I can hear all the way. Here in the prison. In a vigil outside the White House Thursday night, the kids sing the song. They're joined by other supporters to mark the second anniversary of Abedini's imprisonment. Franklin Graham helped organize the event 
and led a prayer for the pastor. We pray, Father, that you would surround him with your angels. In Abedini's recent letter to his daughter, he answers the question, why haven't the prayers for his homecoming been answered yet? Saying God is in control and all is for his good purpose. We try so hard to have that, you know, in our life to have this, you know, bubble of uh, family and comfort. But a lot of times following Christ does not mean that. It, you know, Jesus said it, it requires persecution. You will be persecuted. You will be in prison. The family's now been separated for more than 800 days. They urged the White House to do more to free Abedini. We don't know why it's taking so long, but we're going to trust God. And, uh, and we should be proud that he is standing up for his faith and that God's using this uh, to be glorified. And while she waits for a reunion with her husband, she prays. People are praying for the pastor today at more than 500 vigils around the world. That's according to the American Center for Law and Justice, which represents the Abedini family. CNN asked the Iranian president about the pastor and others in jail. The president said their aim is that laws are respected and trials fair. But a 2013 United Nations investigation just released this month found that Abedini was unjustly targeted for peacefully exercising his Christian faith. Brian? Jason Cowley, thank you. Up next, a gateway so many families traveled through in their journey to America will reopen soon. And we discuss a new movement and magazine opening the discussion on feminism and faith. We're so grateful you can join us for EWTN News Nightly on this Friday evening. I'm Brian Patrick. Well, another recall alert, this time some late model Fords, 2013, 2014 models. The automaker says about 850,000 cars are affected by the recall, mainly the C-Max Compact, the Ford Fusion, Escape, and Lincoln MKZ. The problem, a faulty control module that could short circuit. It would keep airbags and other safety devices from deploying properly. Ford said it's not aware of any accidents related to this problem. Dealers will replace the faulty part at no cost to vehicle owners. Automakers as a whole have recalled more than 40 million vehicles in the U.S. this year. That is a record number, by the way. New crew members arrive at the International Space Station today. These new guys, one American astronaut and two Russian cosmonauts, will stay at the station for six months, joining three other crew members. For the time being, U.S. crew members have to be ferried to the station aboard a Russian Soyuz spacecraft. The U.S. just announced a deal with Boeing and SpaceX to soon deliver astronauts to the station. That should happen within the next few years. For the first time in 60 years, parts of historic Ellis Island open to the public next week. The crumbling sick ward is separate from the rest of the Ellis Island hospital complex. This is where the sickest immigrants came on their final days. In this room, you were pretty bad off. Uh, the, for some people, actually for most people, this was your last stop on Ellis Island. Um, if you couldn't be better, made better here, you either died or you were sent back to your home country. So your last view, if you guys noticed out that window, is the Statue of Liberty. 1.2 million immigrants received medical care here between 1901 and 1954. In its day, the complex was the largest U.S. medical health service institution in the country. There are wards for contagious diseases, mental health, and obstetrics. This space is part of the family histories, both good and bad, for the immigrants who passed through. Hundreds of thousands of people had been treated here in the hospital. Uh, there had been deaths here, many births here. Uh, there were peaceful people that were deported because they were sick. Visitors will be wearing hard hats, wandering through broken glass into rooms without electricity and across overgrown grass. The areas where the public will go have been tested and cleaned, but nothing has been actually restored. And like many of your families, mine has a personal connection with Ellis Island. It was the gateway to a life of freedom in America for my own mother and grandmother who immigrated from Germany in the 1930s. Well, a group of women from different faiths and backgrounds are launching a new web magazine together, Alt Fem. The magazine seeks to open the discussion on feminism and faith. We're joined by the co-founders, Ashley McGuire and Asma Udin. How did you come up with the project? 
Well, it all started about five and a half years ago when I launched our first faith-specific web magazine, Alt Muslima. And it was just rooted in my experience growing up a Muslim female in America and dealing with um, a lot of questions related to gender, questions that were uh, inspired by, by primarily uh, the media portrayals of women in Islam, um, but also by questions of just what I was viewing within the community and understanding that a lot of people were struggling to kind of come to terms with how to be a devout Muslim and also um, negotiate with some of the trickier aspects of just living that faith. And how's that merged with the Catholic side here? Sure. So Asma and I met doing religious freedom work and found that we had um, so much in common when it came to the way our faith informed important decisions about being a woman in modern society. And so um, I launched Alt Catholica about three years ago, and then we decided to create an even bigger platform where women of all faiths could be involved who are dealing with many of the same issues. And how is feminism addressed in Alt-Fem different from the, the cultural view of it here in the United States? Well, I think a lot of the women, especially many of the women who were at our launch, have a similar experience where they feel like modern feminism doesn't speak for them fully or there's something missing from the way feminism deals with women today, especially women of faith who I think so often feel like feminism is pitted against faith as if they're mutually exclusive, whereas many women find their faith to be a source of great empowerment and strength. Yeah, and on a wider picture, so many feel like Christians and Muslims are pitted against each other, that yet you're a Catholic, you're a Muslim. How has this partnership been going for you? Well, I think it's just, um, it's been eye-opening. And for a lot of women, even at the conference and our experience over the course of uh, many years working together on our specific magazines, it was eye-opening because people were for the first time realizing just how much we have in common, um, especially when it comes to question of gender and social values. And so I think that the learning process has been amazing. And I think what I thought was one of the best parts of the conference was um, just how everybody was just like on the same wavelength. There was this amazing synergy among the people on the panels and, am and among each panel, um, even though each panel was hugely diverse uh, in terms of religion. So it's possible to believe very different things and yet respect the beliefs of others. Yeah, and we're very, we, we very much stress that we all believe what we believe. And so, you know, this is not a wishy-washy thing where we're dumbing down our beliefs, but instead um, looking at where those beliefs sort of merge or mirror each other. And one example I'd give from our conference was a discussion about motherhood and pregnancy. And one of our Muslim panelists said that um, in Islam, being pregnant is basically similar to being in a state of constant prayer and fasting in terms of rewards in the next life, which is very similar to Catholic understanding of sort of um, being in a state of sanctification, um, that there's a very spiritual aspect to pregnancy. So that's just one example of the way there's so much overlap between um, the way women are navigating these issues today. So you are both women of faith. What are the issues, the, the key issues that women of faith are challenged with in today's society that you'll address with all fem? Um, there's a number of issues. I think motherhood was one of the biggest. There's, there's a lot of interest in what does it be, mean to be a mother um, in society today. And those conversations parallel the ones you're seeing in secular society, like work-life balance. Um, I think dating and marriage are big topics. Just what is feminism? Um, and then, you know, we're, we're hoping to do more sort of events that hone in a little bit, like what does it mean to be a woman of faith who's not able because of economic reasons to stay home with her children? All right, this is a web-based magazine. What is the website? It is altfemmag.com. A-L-T-F-E-M-M-A-G, right? Yes, correct. Altfemmag.com. Ashley McGuire and Asma Uden Odin, I'm sorry, thank you. We appreciate the perspective that you both gave us, and thanks for joining us. Thank you. And thank you for watching tonight and each night this week. Until Monday, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, watch again anytime you like on EWTN's YouTube page. For all of us at EWTN News Nightly, I'm Brian Patrick. We're going to leave you tonight revisiting some of the wonderful moments from Pope Francis's recent trip to Albania. Good night and God bless you.